Hello and welcome. And today I'm very pleased to be joined by Kevin Donaghy, who has written a book, um, a cu I, suppose, I was going to say a curious title, you might say it's a curious subject called Stories of Cancer and Hope. Hurrah, I think I've managed to get it in focus. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you very much, Katrina. Thank you very much for uh, for having me on uh, to talk about our book. So I've your book is very much a dip in, dip out book of people's stories um, who have have and had cancer. Um, the first thing that struck me, and I've no idea why it should have struck me because I do know better, is that the vast range of ages and we know that cancer is indiscriminate in whoever gets it. And I think that's what's so nice. It's such a wide range of people that you manage to, I think, as you said, sit and have a cup of tea with and, and chat about their story. And their story, more often than not, isn't actually about the cancer. It's about their lives and how they, they're, they're moving with it. So I have two burning questions mm -hmm. as a burning questions. One is I would be very interested to hear if you're happy to share your own story. And then the big question, why did you write the book? Yeah, I'm very happy to do both, Katrina. So so my story um, started in, in late 2017 when I went to uh, my local GP with a, a strange looking spot on my arm, um, which I was assured wasn't cancerous, didn't look cancerous. And if I put some cream on it, hopefully it should disappear. But if it changed, to go back to the GP. So... I, I tried the cream for a while, it stabilized, and then a few months later, it started to change shape and color. And I knew nothing about skin cancer at that point in time. So I then went back and I was referred to a dermatologist who um, uh, arranged for a biopsy. And then a couple of days later, I got a phone call when I was away on business in London saying, can you come in this afternoon? Which is never a good sign, uh, I now know, looking back on, on my journey. And it turned out that the, uh, the rather strange looking spot was a uh, stage two melanoma, it was skin cancer. And for, for anyone in the cancer world, uh, mel uh, skin cancer is the only cancer you can actually see. There are other cancers you can feel, but skin cancer is the only one that you can see. So a few months later, I had that removed from my forearm uh, by a plastic surgeon. I then also had a lymph node removed from under my arm because skin cancer, uh, will typically spread to your lymph nodes, as a number of other cancers do. And a few weeks later, I remember being in the middle of uh, Princess Street in Edinburgh when I got a phone call saying, congratulations, you can have a great weekend, your cancer's not spread. And at that point, I, I dropped down onto my knees in the middle of the busy street in Edinburgh, and the, the whole relief and emotion for myself mm. and my family just completely washed over me. So for 18 months, um, life was fantastic. It was great. We were cancer free. We'd, we'd managed to get over the that horrendous hurdle that was put in front of us. And then I experienced a back pain, which was so severe. I was admitted to accident and emergency in Manchester. Again, I was away on business. Um, and following an x-ray, I was then advised I needed a CT scan. Um, which it really didn't occur to me that it was cancer because my cancer um, had been treated. Um, so I was then invited to go and see an oncologist on Friday the 13th of December 2019. I'm not usually superstitious, but I sat in the oncologist room very stupidly um, on my own. Uh, I had told my wife and a best friend, no, it's okay, you know, it, it won't be, you know, I can't imagine they're going to tell me, you know, devastating news. They might mm. say they need to research this or, you know, do some tests. But the oncologist then told me I had stage four metastatic melanoma with a tumour on my right lung and a tumour next to my spine, which had been causing the severe back pain. And he told me this was life limiting and incurable. Um, but he hoped to put me on a course of immunotherapy which is one of the new rock star drugs available in the cancer world um, to try and extend my life. So everything changed from that day. The, the wrecking ball of cancer started to swing wildly uh, through our lives. And I then had to go and tell uh, my wife and family and our teenage children in the run up to Christmas that the cancer was back and 
the, the, the unfortunate thing was, you know, I work in the world of IT and we deal with data, we deal with measurement constantly. So I had asked the oncologist, you know, what the potential outcomes were. And he showed me a graph. They're, they're incredibly scary graphs, um, overall survival statistics for my type of cancer and the treatment that I was going to start on. And within a three month period, about 66% um, of the people diagnosed were no longer with us. Wow. So, so yeah, that, that was quite sobering. So there was a three in one chance that, uh, that the immunotherapy would work. So in January, 2020, I started the immunotherapy treatment. And my wife and I had decided that 2020 was going to be a year that we spent time with friends and family and hopefully traveled in between my three week uh, um, course. And you know what's coming next, Katrina. Yes. <laughs> um, so, um, so yeah, and then so we had all these plans for arranging holidays, looking to travel insurance for, for being on cancer treatment, which is can be a bit of a minefield as well. Um, and then COVID hit uh, in March of that year. So I found myself in my house on the shielding list with my wife, my two children, um, but having Zoom conversations with everybody else. And I was quite open about my cancer. And I had shared it with friends, family, um, colleagues. And it just, my mental health um, just took a real, uh, a real hammering because I didn't know if I was going to be able to, to leave the house um, again. No one knew what was happening with COVID. And I didn't know if the treatment was working. So I felt incredibly alone and isolated. And I knew I needed to try and reach out and find people who'd gone through a similar experience or were going through a similar experience. Um, that, and that was how the idea for um, sharing stories um, within the cancer world first started. And I think the thing that sprung out when I read your story, because your story is hidden, I would say, because it's right <laughs> in the middle of the book. Um, yeah. Yes. It and what struck me was it was just so honest of you is to say you you know about doing it not on your own which is the what you led this um part of our conversation is is it you know it's not good to try to be brave you don't need to be and I don't think it helps. Uh, yeah, you're right. It doesn't, and you know, be, being you know, fifty percent of the population are, are men, and we we like to uh, perhaps do things on our own and uh, not not show any weakness. And, and there's certainly, a, there's a burden, uh, not, not just for myself or, or men in general, where, you know, if you, you know, are living with a, a life-changing diagnosis, you feel as if you have to be strong, you have to be brave, you have to carry this on behalf of your family. And and yeah, COVID was, was the catalyst for me, for my mental health and my wife and my, my kids mental health you know I needed help I needed to find other people because it, it's a lived experience and people mm -hmm. you know are, are very good at empathizing but unless you've been through that lived experience um, it's very hard to relate and to understand so I've, I found a fantastic uh, melanoma support group and a men's mental health group who, who were both on zoom um, and I would join them regularly and it was a very safe environment to talk about my my hopes and my fears and the impact it was having on my mental health. And I, I think, you know, you've hit the nail on the head, I think, about you found a men's support group because yeah. men and women, as we know, you know, generally, and I'm speaking very generally, yeah. do discuss things in a completely different way, i.e. women are far more open, they're used to discussing health issues, but for men, it is a completely different story on the whole. And I think it's to have the confidence as a man, and especially, um, I was going to say older men, I think I think mm -hmm. things are changing and I think younger men are far more open in yeah. many ways than older generations. So I think if you're, you know, I would say maybe over 40 or something, you are brought up where you absolutely have those as you said you know you're used to coping on your own you don't show emotion so to to have to learn to start communicating let alone about something that's about so personal it must be very it, difficult it, it is very challenging and if you look back you know my, my parents generation my grandparents generation especially when it came to something like cancer you know it, mm. it, it was it was referred to in hushed tones mm. um, and not really talked about you know we know 
unfortunately, more people are being diagnosed by cancer uh, with cancer. You know, 50% of the population are expected to, to be diagnosed with cancer, but more people are living, there's more treatment. But if I look back to growing up in the 70s and 80s, it was almost a death sentence when someone yeah. was diagnosed with cancer. And you do carry that that forward. And it's it's not an easy topic to, to talk about. Um, but if you find people who are, uh, who are going through the same lived experience, then it's a safe environment. And I was mm. very, very fortunate to find that. I think it cancer definitely has very much a stigma attached to it. And then you start getting into the type of cancers and the stigmas attached with the, the different cancers can be a real challenge. It, it certainly can. And, you know, and again, there's so many misconceptions. Perhaps people you know, don't want to know too, too much detail about someone's cancer. But, you know, with, with the type of cancer I have, which is melanoma, which is the most dangerous type of skin cancer, you know, there's a misconception. Oh, you have melanoma? Oh, just cut it out. You'll be fine. Um, yeah, they did cut mine out, but it bypassed my lymph nodes and went into my bloodstream. So it's you know it's now I will always be stage stage four cancer, and it's very difficult to talk to people as well. You know most people may ask you how you are, which is the natural you know question to to ask. But you you have to try and gauge how much information you give someone as well, um, mm -hmm. who, who's never had that lived experience, because um, you, you don't want to scare you don't want to scare the life out of them, but you you also don't want to give them you know false information as well. Well. On a positive note, you've obviously gone way past the three months period. <laughs> I, I certainly have. I was very fortunate that um, because my, my, my tumours um, were both quite small. So the oncologist was, was quite positive, as, as positive as he could be. Um, they don't give false hope in, uh, in the cancer environment. Um, but he thought I had a reasonable chance of responding to the treatment. And I started the treatment at the end of January. And then on the 23rd of April, and th these dates are, uh, are burned into your psyche, um, we were in the garden. It was a sunny day, as it was during the first COVID lockdown. I got a call from my oncologist who said um, that uh, both tumours had shrank um, uh, as visible in my first scan. And I, I got to the point uh, where eight months after I was initially diagnosed, due to severe side effects, which I won't go into all the details, but um, I had some really bad side effects, which hospitalized me for a while. But my oncologist was so pleased at my progress that I stopped treatment after eight months. And for the past two and a half years, I've been classed as no um, evidence detected NED. So my tumors are, are not visible, but it's, it's in my bloodstream and I'll always have um, stage, four, stage four melanoma. It in the years that Talk Health has been going, which is yeah. now uh, oh, well over 20 years, mm. when we first started or when we were sort of developing Talk Health, it was looking at what conditions should we look at. And we were very much on the chronic conditions. Yeah. And we totally swayed away from cancer because cancer was always very acute. Yes. And it's amazing how cancer has now come into chronic condition for, for mm -hmm. many different stages of cancer, um, yeah. which is interesting. And it just shows how much medicine has moved forward in that period. It, it certainly has. And, and, and unfortunately, with more people being diagnosed, you know, we, all know, we all know people who have had cancer or have cancer, and we'll know people who will have cancer. And, you know, 50% of us will be personally affected as well. And, you know, there, there are perhaps, you know, a number of reasons but behind that that growth in statistics, but it's it's becoming. It, it, there's certainly people who are very open about talking about about cancer, and when I was, uh, I I decided that you know, the power of me talking about my cancer and hearing other people's cancer story within the safe environment of a melanoma Zoom call gave me the idea that perhaps, you know, it, it, it helped me hearing about other people's story. So perhaps if I could gather some stories and share them, um, you know, maybe about 20 stories and share them amongst people who've been affected by cancer. And I wanted to try and get as wide a range of cancer stories as possible. Mm. One place I found where people, some people were very open about their cancer was on social media. Um, and I actually approached a number of people on on Twitter and asked them if they'd be willing to share their stories. Um, and I got an amazing response. Um, not everybody's that open, but yeah. it's great to see that, you know, the, the barriers are being broken down uh, yes. about cancer. 
Uh, and I think it's a well, thank you, because you've actually answered the, the why there. <laughs> why you've written the book. Yeah. But you know, as you said earlier, it, it is a personal journey and it's possibly not one that you know how you would react to until it does happen to yourself. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's 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 a lived experience. Um, at, at the start of the book, um, I try and um, draw reference to the fact that you know my my wife and and my sisters can can tell me you know what childbirth is like, but I'll I'll never experience it as as a man. That's that's a lived experience. Mm -hmm. um, and the same with cancer. And, and even though there's different types of cancer, within the book, we have 39 personal stories um, of cancer, including my own. And it covers a wide range of different types of cancer, different stages, and unfortunately, different outcomes as well. It would have been quite disingenuous if I, if all 39 stories had a happy ending, because mm -hmm. the, that's um, the unfortunate reality of cancer. There's some stories written about people um, who had passed before the book was written. And some of the contributors, unfortunately, have passed. But we knew that because, you know, they had a terminal um, diagnosis. But th throughout the book, um, there are common themes that, that come come through, um, hopes and fears, um, what people, you know, milestones perhaps that people want to try and achieve for me it was seeing my son graduate seeing my my daughter uh, go to university seeing Scotland in, in another major football tournament which uh, which you know would, would, was up there but you know th th there are so many things that people can relate to who either have cancer or have a loved one that have cancer as well and there was I was very privileged that that people were incredibly open uh, in wanting to share their stories and what hope meant to them in order to help other people affected by cancer. So let's look more, um, I'd, I'd certainly like to go back um, as we spoke just before we started recording about families and carers, yes. but just the hope side of the book. What, what do you feel, why would you encourage people to read the book? Because hopefully it's because it's the hope side of it. It, it 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 is. There's there's an I'd say number of reasons that I would encourage people to read the book. And you know, there's, there's thirty nine stories. I would certainly say take your time. Don't try and read them all at once. Um, some of them are are quite emotional. That there's humour. There's um, you know every every human emotion is is displayed within the book. But uh, someone told me when I, when I was writing it, you know, hope is constant, but but it, it can change as well. Um, if if I look at perhaps my circumstance, when I went to see that oncologist, you know, I hoped it wasn't cancer, but the fact I was meeting an oncologist probably meant that there was. Um, I, I, it then changed to, okay, it was cancer. I hope it was curable. Um, it wasn't curable. Well, I hope I could I could live, you know, a, a, a few more extra years to, to hit these milestones in, in my personal life. And for other people, um, people perhaps diagnosed with, with a terminal um, cancer, the, the hope again can potentially change. The, the hope they have you know, a pain a pain-free um, death. They hope they're able to do things before they die. And that hope can also transfer. You know, I hope my family are, are okay. So hope is constant, but it can mean different things to different people uh, during time. And there is always hope. Um, one of my one of the stories within the book, I'm not sure if you've read it yet. It's a lady called uh, Deborah Cairns who's been treated for breast cancer, and she went into uh, her cancer treatment center. And sitting opposite her was a lady who had at least two or three diamond rings on every finger, mm -hmm. and Deborah could not take her eyes off this lady's hands. And the lady saw Deborah looking and she said, "Do you want to know the story behind the, these diamond rings, dear?" And, and she then told Deborah that she'd been diagnosed um, with life-limiting cancer and her husband had promised to buy her a diamond ring on each year's anniversary <laughs> from that point. And she had 21 diamond rings on her finger. And she joked to Deborah that her husband was, was contemplating killing her just to save some. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, and Deborah took so much hope from the fact, here's somebody who's been coming back for, you know, over 20 years and yeah yeah and and we we all have hope and whether it's relating to to cancer diagnosis they're all things that, that we hope for and there's some very very positive uh, messages within the book which based on feedback i've, I've had from people I, I know we're helping and i think hope is so important 
and hope does go towards actually making you positive and when I say making you better I don't mean necessarily curing you but it does change and I think the other thing is that you know having a healthy respect for cancer mm-hmm. I mean lots of people say well we won't respect but respect it in terms of how you look after your body it, it, exactly and, and you know per- personally you know I, I knew how to fight on my hands um, and I, I concentrated on the things I could do physically to help. Um, our, our daughter had turned vegan a couple of years previously, so I took a great interest in her cooking and uh, and started to share meals and and, and help her um, when possible. I, I, I would go for long walks. Obviously, during COVID, it was doing laps of laps of the garden. And and another thing that that I have found in chatting to people, um, I've, I've, I now know so many people within the cancer community. Um, whilst it is a physical battle, it's also a mental battle for you and your family as well. Mm-hmm. And trying to find a support mechanism or or other people to help you with that mental uh, battle is incredibly important. And it, it's easy to say, oh, just just have a positive attitude. There are days when you don't want to get out of bed. Yeah. There really are. And there are also days when you know, you might have got good news about yourself or, or someone else and, and, and you're... Uh, you reach an extreme high, but the the mental you cannot underestimate the mental impact um, that cancer diagnosis and cancer treatment can have. And finding that support network uh, for me was was vital. Mm. I, I, and I think that is you know with all kind of con- conditions, isn't it? And I always sort of say to people quite often, um, actually when when people come and work with me, yeah. is I would say I'm not. You know, you always think your boss is a mind reader. So if you're sitting in the mm-hmm. corner being very quiet, you expect your boss to say, well, to know what's going on. And it's like people don't. And it's so much easier if you can share with people, you know, why is that person grumpy or whatever it is. If if you can explain to someone what you're going through, it makes it so much easier. And the chance of, you know, because we all end up communicating in the wrong way and think, oh, God, if only I told them this or I've said it that way. You know, miscommunication. We're great at miscommunication. Yes, we are. Yes. Yeah. Or or, or not listening as well uh, from the other other side. And yeah, especially, you know, there are a number of charities and organisations that are out there to support you personally. But there's there are also some great schemes to to help, you know, your your employers as well. Um, You know, every every, you know, Every organisation will have experienced a member of staff going through uh, through a cancer journey, mm. or or you know someone they love is go- going through it. And just to pick out, you know, uh, Maggie's for instance, and um, the book we're working very closely with Maggie's, who have twenty four um, uh, centres throughout the UK. Maggie's uh, have a have a course to support uh, people in the workplace with cancer, and they'll spend time talking to managers and, and HR about you know how to try and support employees um, who are who are affected by cancer, and it it touches all aspects of your life. Mm-hmm. It, it really does. And, and and another story in the book um, for anybody who has gone through chemotherapy, and especially ladies, um, the fear of losing your hair. Some chemotherapy leads you to you uh, lo- losing your hair. One of the stories in the book is from a lady called Claire Paxman, who's part of the Paxman family, who developed a Paxman scalp cooling uh, technology. And they talk about you know the, the the impact of hair loss that has on not only women but on men as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact you know you lose all of your body hair. And you know, they were recalling stories of you know men being in the in the gym locker and you know wanting to wait till everyone had left before they, they got changed mm-hmm. because there's a stigma attached to it. But it is the shame, uh, isn't it? And it's like there should be no shame <clears throat> with any of these things. Yes, yeah, you're, you're right. There the shouldn't. Attitudes are are changing, changing slowly. And we certainly hope that you know that, that through our book we we reach people who are either directly or indirectly affected by cancer. And the main theme of the book is you're not alone. Mm. Uh, and, and people will find stories they can relate to and people and and themes. And as I say, that you know, we covered so many different human emotions and I was incredibly privileged that, you know, 38 other people uh, felt confident enough to, to share their stories. And sometimes people were telling me things that they'd never told anyone else as well. And, the, the privilege I had in, in hearing that and 
I knew that perhaps having been on my own journey, you know, people felt confident enough mm. to share their stories with me because I'd, I'd, I'd been there. I think quite often people just want to have, you know, quite often there isn't a door that opens that allows them to have that conversation. And you open that door for them to have that conversation, which I think is, which is kind of great. But sort of saying about that, one other area that I was keen to talk about, because yeah. we have a lot of carers who mm -hmm. are Talk House members and yes. who so often are overlooked and forgotten and that the burden of care can be huge. It, it certainly can, can do. Um, and yet yeah, all the attention is focused on, you know, on people like myself. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm the one going into to the centre to receive whatever type of, of cancer treatment, um, you know, whether it's Macmillan, Maggie's, you know, smaller local local charities are, are, are there for me. And, and yes, you know, my wife and children can perhaps be a bit left out. Um, and, but, you know, certainly, again, referring back to Maggie's, um, in their 24 centres and they're adding new centres every year. Um, they're there to support um, friends and family as well. And my my wife um, got a lot of um, a lot of support um, when she was in Maggie's, um, chatting to to the staff there because they're there mm -hmm. to help her not affected by cancer. And the interesting the interesting thing about Maggie's, I've spoken to people about Maggie's, and some people think it's um, perhaps a, a hospice or you need to have an appointment, but. All you need to do is just walk through the door and you get this amazing warm welcome and and they will support anybody affected by cancer. And there are other charities out there that, that will do the same as well. And and sometimes, you know, you either have to look for it or you chat to other people with a similar experience and, and they'll tell you where they got their support mm -hmm. as well. So it, it is a question of reaching out more often than not, because people don't, you do need to help yourself as well. You, you, you do. And interestingly enough, when, you know, when you hear the word cancer from a doctor or an oncologist, um, it's quite natural to go into shock, um, as I did, um, mm -hmm. especially when I was told about my stage four incurable diagnosis. And it's very hard to take information in. You know, mm -hmm. you, you're told perhaps procedures, statistics, um, um, that, uh, and also perhaps given some leaflets, but you, you know, you go into shock. And, and for me, it was almost like a, a living grief. You know, you, 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 you're shocked, you're angry, you, you don't want to believe it. You, you, you lash out at people as well. Um, but you know, you're right, sometimes taking that step, and it's an incredibly hard one to do, you know, where can I find help? You know, Macmillan, Maggie's, um, specialist cancer um, charities, you know, you, you've got, um, you know, prostate cancer, uh, brain tumor cancer. Now, there are so many different cancer organizations out there which are online that just just by looking or perhaps sending a message, you, you'll be amazed at the support that you'll be able to find. Mm. And I think, you know, different support is suitable for different people, isn't it? And how you take it. And I think you're also very sensitive and somebody may say something to you like, just in the wrong way and you completely that puts you right off it it's a tricky path to to tread I'm sure it 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 really is um and you know people have the best intentions as well um you know when, when you get to the point where you, you want to let people know um about your cancer diagnosis um and what the potential treatments are um it can be very difficult and people can say things which um, um perhaps aren't appropriate. But, you know, you, you do have to take on board that it's probably a shock for them as well. Mm. Um, and, yeah, you, I, I, you hear stories of, you know, how people have reacted. Some people come running towards you and, you know, here's a lasagna that I baked for you and I'll pick the kids up from school. Other people, you might not just see them or hear from them because yeah. they're finding it very difficult. But what, one thing you really don't want to hear when you tell someone about a cancer diagnosis is people they know who have died of that cancer. And um, that's that can be a, that can be a tricky thing, uh, and sometimes conversation stopper. But it, it's it's amazing that the support that you'll get from from people, um, if you open up, and you don't have to tell them everything, no, um, about how you how you're feeling. But yeah, there there is definitely support out there for you. Well, all I can say is that you radiate positivity and hope, 
And I'm sure that's exactly why everybody came, were very pleased to share their stories with you. Well, yeah, th thank you very much for that. So the, the initial idea was I, I wanted to print a thousand copies and give them away to, to cancer charities. And I approached a number of cancer charities with the idea that, you know, we'd be producing this book. Mm. And and it it was born and produced um, through the efforts of, of my friends and family. There was no publisher. Um, my daughter, my son, my sister, uh, good friends, we all got together. And thanks to sponsorship from one of the story contributors, a chap called Ricky Nickel, we were able to give away 1,400 copies free of charge. Wow. And then other cancer charities asked for it. And to date, we've given over 7,000 copies of the book to over, to over 90 different UK and Irish cancer charities and treatment centres. And the book is now available to download digitally and you can buy physical copies. And all of my royalties... Um, go to Maggie's. Um, I don't make anything from this book at all. Um, and my, Maggie's, who supported me and a number of other other contributors, um, they get the royalties from from the book sales. Excellent. Well, we've I've I've shown the book, and we will put it with all links attached. So hopefully, people will go out and uh, and get it and support all the charities. Thank you very much for, for doing so. And, and one last thing, I don't mention my daughter, but uh, my my daughter um, designed the book cover and also did a freehand illustration inside oh, wow. of a uh, wonderful lady, Anna, who the book is dedicated to, who was part of my melanoma uh, wow. Zoom group. So it's it's a, it's a labour of, of love from friends and family as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, Kevin. Thank you and very we, much. And Katrina. we wish you well for the foreseeable future and onwards. Thank you very much. Thank you.